It's the morning of August 29th, uh, 1997, and uh, somewhere from New Orleans and the Crescent City uh, Jazz and Heritage Festival to the JVC Festival in New York and onwards to the mid-continent, uh, the Dakota Bar and Grill. Mulgrew Miller, I've been following you. <laughs> well, thank you. It's great to be here to talk with you. Well, you have a remarkable, as all the musicians under the wing of Art Farmer, <laughs> remarkable credentials. And I, I just might, uh, first of all, touch on, on the leadership that you're presently touring with and, and uh, just describe your impressions of the man behind the flumpet, mm -hmm. that beautiful combination of trumpet and flugelhorn, Art Farmer. Well, yes. Uh, well, Art is one of the great lyrical players and the, one of the great melodic players of this music. And he has those qualities uh, that uh, I really envy and that I'm trying to uh, ascribe to, you know, to be more lyrical and to be more melodic and beautifully harmonic. And so those, those are all the things that I like. And of course, you know, Art is a legend. Does he drive the improvisation? Well, I mean, he he sets the tone for everything, you know, uh, um, with with his beautiful ear for harmony notes, and and so uh, it inspires me to place chords and harmony a certain way. So it, it does set set a certain tone for for the music. Well, of course, you've had experience with another legend, Woody Shaw, the late Woody Shaw. Absolutely. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in Woody's band for three years. And he was certainly one of the great innovators of this music and of the trumpet. And how did he uh, stimulate your, your playing? Well, as, as with every creative artist that I've played with, um, I've always been stimulated uh, from observing um, how they were very uh, creative and always searching for new and and innovative and, and ways to do things. So Woody was 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 a visionary, and and I found that very very stimulating. And when you say visionary, you might describe a little more in detail uh, what that vision was. Well, uh, Woody had a personal vision about how he wanted to play jazz or how he wanted jazz to sound when he played it. And uh, that means that uh, he um, used different um, harmonic devices than what was normally being used. And he also um, had uh, a very creative harmonic and melodic concept of improvising and of composition. So uh, he, it, all of this made for a very unique sound and a personal sound. And then there was that, uh, and is, that very uh, formidable artist, uh, Betty Carter. Sure, yeah. I was, I was with Betty Carter for eight months. And um, it was, well, my first job after I left the Mercer Ellington Orchestra, which uh, brought me to New York. In, in other words, when, when I joined Betty's Car Betty Carter's band, that's when I moved to New York. And Betty's a great artist as well. You know, she's another one of those people who's always thinking about music and thinking about new and better ways to do things. And that kind of accompaniment is certainly, is it different from being the, uh, the part of the rhythm section behind a Woody Shaw or an art farmer or the vocalist, the vocal art? Well, um, in some ways, yes, but, you know, in some ways it's different to be uh, behind, it's different from one horn player to the next horn player. So, that being said, with Betty, it was different from any other vocalist because Betty was so rhythmic and dynamic, it was often like playing behind a horn player. So it wasn't the usual uh, tinkle the piano, tickle the ivories as soft as possible all the time. With Betty, there was a whole range of dynamics, much like many horn bands that I've been with. Certainly not real theater cabaret. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, the legend, the Ellington legend, you, you had time with Mercer, and 
That must have been quite an experience for you. Uh, yeah, that that was a great experience on a number of levels. Uh, first of all, uh, on a musical level, absolutely. Uh, it was an opportunity for me to educate myself and to observe the mind of Ellington through his compositions and uh, somewhat see how his mind worked. But also on a personal level, it was it was my first big time road experience. So. You know, I became a man in that band, 21, living on the road with 18 other people all day and all night long in a bus. The good old road, the street academy or the highway academy, absolutely. the one night stand academy. That, absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, there's not enough of that now for the younger players, you, you know, and it's not enough big bands, that's for sure. And uh, that, that's one aspect of musical experience that a lot of the youngsters are missing, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, fortunately, there are a lot of young musicians still coming to New York want to play this music. Do you have any... You've watched the business now for quite some time, and this is the year 1997. What do you see as trends? Is there any hope that a big band uh, renaissance might come about? Uh, is there other uh, elements out there that you see and observe in the business that are positive as far as the jazz audience and jazz development and jazz musician is concerned? Well, the most positive thing I see was just w what I just mentioned was the fact that there's still a lot of young musicians that want to play this music and they, they're coming to New York in droves. But... Um, about big bands, I'm not so sure because, you know, uh, the social atmosphere is different than when uh, the, the, the uh, big bands first came to be, you know, the dancing and people don't dance to that anymore. So I, I don't know, it's hard for me to say whether the big bands will come back like they were, but there, were, there are many musicians who still have great arranging skills and, and know how to write for that. Um, that that setting and so for that reason alone I think uh, big bands were survived to at least to a certain extent in your art uh, and development what in your value system frames your discipline and makes it work for you well I, I mean this is I think this is high art, art and um, it, it um, affirms humanity. I mean, this is one of the few things that we as humans do that animals don't do. <laughs> they do almost everything else we do, you know. They sleep and they eat and they, uh, you know, fight for food and <laughs> for survival and everything else. And, uh, but uh, this is one of the unique things that humans can do is to practice something and, and try to perfect it. Uh, and, and ascertain a high level of, of uh, proficiency. So I, I think it makes it all worthwhile and, and uh, through it you can, you can inspire other humans you know, through the beauty and the power of music. And that's what makes it all worthwhile to me. Well, it is the morning of the 29th of August, 1997. And I've been tracking Mulgrew Miller from the Jazz and Heritage Festival to uh, the JVC Festival, the Iridium, and uh, beyond, and finally caught up with him at the Dakota Bar and Grill, St. Paul, Minneapolis, in Bandana Square, where those great locomotives screamed to the west after getting repaired here. So some of the freight train blues that were born along the way came from this center it's good to talk with you and touch base and to hear what makes Mulgrew Miller's art go round. Thank you, ladies. My pleasure. <laughs>